It is day 4,459. I mentioned some upcoming events, but they all pale in comparison to tonight's event. The return this time virtual <laughs> Jada Massey, the author of The Bombay Prince, the third Praveen mystery um, set uh, in uh, old Bombay, featuring the first woman lawyer for the mystery. Um, she has won the Mary Higgins Clark and Agatha Awards um, about the new book Kirkus wrote, Praveen's mystery propels a rich story of female empowerment during a pivotal era. Massey's latest installment in the series is earning advanced praise, including Kate Quinn, who says it is a deliciously satisfying read. The first Praveen mystery series uh, book uh, the Widows of Malabar Hill was an international bestseller and won the Agatha McCavity and Mary Higgins Clark Awards. The second book in the series uh, received the Satipur, uh, the Satipur Moonstone won the Bruce Alexander Memorial Award and was a finalist for the Sue Grafton Memorial Award and the Harper Lee Legal Fiction Prize. And as I was saying, um, I've read them all and I know they've the other two won and were shortlisted for a bunch of awards, but this feels like the best one yet. We are so honored that tonight, uh, Massey is in conversation with one of our favorite local authors, Shauna Singe Baldwin, the author of books, short stories, novels, including Reluctant Rebellions, We Are Not in Pakistan, What the Body Remembers, which is the winner of the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best Books, Tiger's Claw, which is, was a finalist for the Giller Prize and the Selector of Souls. So, Delighted to have you both on the East Coast, it turns out. Um, welcome back to Milwaukee virtually for the moment. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for that generous introduction. I am just delighted to be in communication with Sujata again. Um, I live in Milwaukee and frequently feel that I live at Boswell Books. Daniel is a champion for writers, local and worldwide. And through the pandemic, it seemed Boswell had pivoted seamlessly to virtual. I say seemed because no one did anything seamlessly last year. Uh, and certainly no one pivoted effortlessly, but it looked that way, which is a testament to Daniel's hard work and charisma. I have met many readers and booksellers in my travels, so you can believe me when I say he's a world-class reader and bookseller. Um, Sujata, you and I first met at the Linden Sculpture Garden in Milwaukee at another Boswell Books reading series, which is still going, and it was when you were traveling the Midwest physically. So, is a virtual book launch and tour easier, just different? How is it? Yeah, well, first I wanted to say what a joy it was to meet you at that sculpture garden. And I really appreciated that whole women's group so much. And also that was the first time I met Daniel. That's right. And then I came again for, for the Satapur Moonstone, my second book. So of course I wanted to be with you for the third book. And um, yeah. It's virtual is really not as, as um, dismal as I thought it would be because yeah. I love being in a room and being able to, you know, shake hands with people and hand them books and do things like that. But um, there's the, the thing that's great about it is that I can go to so many more um, places because I'm staying here, you know, I can, and also I can do all my international stuff. And that used to be big flights, like a big flight to India and then traveling. And, and, and now I can, and also book clubs. It's so, so some really good things have come out of our adaptation or, you know, our willingness to try technology for right. really creative social things. That's true. That's true. But I, I wonder if um, people in different parts of the world ask different types of questions or or does that feel like they all, you know, seem to ask very different, uh, very similar questions? Um, I think in India, I get just not quite all the questions I get here. Like mm -hmm. one of the yeah. big questions that I get, you know, the Perveen mystery is the heroine of my series and she is 
Bombay's first woman lawyer. And she's actually modeled after India's first two women lawyers, a solicitor and a barrister. So she, she bears some similarities, but a lot of people, you know, in the US or, or in the West think that there was one code of laws that covered all people right. in India, whereas it was actually segmented based on your religion. Based on your religion, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's stick with you for a minute. I know you want to. I know you want to go to the book, but I'm going to ask you a few <laughs> questions about yourself first. And I'm always so curious about people's name stories, and so. You know, how did you get the name Sujata and uh, what does it mean to you? Yeah. Oh boy. I wonder, <laughs> I've got a, I'm, I'm concerned my parents may be listening in on this call. So there may be something in the chat that goes against <laughs> what I heard. So um, Sujata is, it's, it's a name out of, you know, Buddhist history. Sujata yeah. was the young lady who brought the Buddha, um, rice and milk, a rice and milk dish after he had been sitting in his meditation for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that's why I was named that. Okay, um, how were you named? Well, my mom thinks that my dad had a very special friend in his childhood with this name. That's her mm -hmm. theory. That's her theory. Other people have told me that there was this really huge hit movie called Sujata mm -hmm. in the 50s or 60s. Yeah. And that was a, an influence. The actual meaning of the name is, is born in a good family. And so when people would ask me that meaning, I would just never want to tell them that because I thought it sounded really snobbish. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like they were born in a, in a good family. Like it just- yeah. High born uh, kind of thing, right? Yeah. Although you have, you have uh, really written about the lowborn as well. So I, I think that that, that should uh, uh, save you from that criticism for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, yes, I, so one of my favorite books is, is uh, The Sleeping Dictionary in which you do just that. that. That is a really classic book in my opinion. But anyway, to, uh, to go back to your, your story though, uh, your mother is German and your father is from Bengal, yes? Mm -hmm. And so um, where were you born? Well, I was born in England you were and born they in met England. in England. They were studying mm -hmm. in England and mm -hmm. my first five years roughly were there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was born um, in Surrey. And then I my but my early growing up years were in Newcastle upon Tyne. And apparently I had this really dramatic Geordie accent when I was young. If anybody has spent time in Britain and they've heard, or or you've seen that that movie where the men were all the strippers and the, the you know the town with the silver the problems with the silver, you know that they, it's just a it's like a character kind of accent. And I lost it. You know, children that when when you emigrate and you emigrate before you're 13 it's you have a really good chance of lose, losing an accent. And I also think that if, you, if you're if you the child of foreigners, the other interesting thing is even if you move to a place like the Midwest, mm -hmm. you you might not pick up the regional accent. You or might- you become multi-glossic. You just are more generic because yeah. you don't live with the regional accent. You know, yeah. I have friends that are British, British Pakistani and yeah. their boys speak with a British, a slight British accent, mm -hmm. and they've been born and brought up in the United States. Yeah, but uh, you you can you can also become multiglossic in the sense that you change your accent uh, depending on who you're speaking with. You know, <laughs> and uh, that has happened to me quite a bit because I've I've lived in many different places as well. That's and, a gift. Uh, it's. I, I don't know if it's a gift. I think mm -hmm. it's like you 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 kind of slip into whatever it is that you're that you're talking about also in mixed languages and things like that. Does that happen to you? No, it, well, actually, yes, I do mix languages because yeah. I studied German when I was young and also I had the advantage of visiting Germany quite a bit, um, including in my teen years. Um, and then the next language that I studied was Japanese. And I remember that the German would come into the Japanese. 
And mm-hmm. then after, I, then I tried Spanish briefly, but I, I, I didn't take it seriously. And it's a shame, mm-hmm. it's such an important language. And then when I was over 40, I started trying to learn Hindi. And that was really, That's really hard, hard because mm-hmm. once you get over a certain age, it's much mm-hmm. harder. And also my processing for reading a different script is, script is completely different. I yeah, that's much true. slower than the than the average person. So yeah. I studied it a few different times. And when I was in a daily situation where I was going to class every day, um, that was good. And that happened for a while when I was in Minnesota. Um, I lived in Minnesota for six years. Um, you know, just in the mid 2000s, I moved there and my father is there. And so he helped me with my homework. Oh, and that, great. Was really, great. that was really helpful. Yeah. So, so which leads me to the question, um, tell us about your connection to Japan first for the first 10 books that you wrote. They're all set in the Japanese culture or with a Japanese protagonist and, mm-hmm. and all in the first person as well. And so, so tell us about, um, you know, your connection to Japan and then India, you know, the two countries that have inspired so many of your books. Yes, um, I wrote about Japan. I moved there when I was uh, 27, a newlywed, and uh, my husband was working for the U.S. Navy. So we were there for a couple of years. And the way that I spent my time was studying the language and um, the cultural arts. And I did a little bit of English teaching. And so I started writing my first mystery series. And I think, you know, what's important about this part of my life is I learned to write mysteries. I learned the importance of characters. And also I was exploring Japan and I wanted to express something about the place I was in to kind of share how wonderful it was and how little known it was. And so I think that over those years, and it actually turned out to be 11 books, oh, I um, was able to learn certain ways of, you know, bringing weight. How can you describe a culture? How can you describe a scene and a foreign train station without stopping in the whole story and yeah. telling everything about it and then going on and having your activity yeah. uh, you know, I learned how to weave weave things, things in and, and, like, and that's your forte that's for sure you've done that in in all of your novels I think just the weaving in of the details is so so carefully done and yet so innocuous <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah. so and then and then India after that it's it's surprising to me that you waited so long to write about India, actually. Yeah, well, there, I mean, there are a few reasons for it. Um, back in the time that I was a young journalist, and I was uh, that was what I did before I moved to Japan. I worked as a newspaper reporter. I remember I was kind of, in, I was interested in writing fiction, too. I just thought it would all come together much later, but I was experimenting a little bit. And I remember... It, being expected to write about India and Uh that kind of outraged me because Mm -hmm. I thought well I'm expected to write about it because of the way that I look and because I have an Indian name Mm -hmm. and as if I as if I'm not an American I can't do other things so my reaction was I'm not going to run and start writing about a place that is it yes it's half my identity but it's not it not your whole identity right exactly and right. then <laughs> later on what happened when I you know when I had children that I became more invested in um sharing India with them yeah. it's it's really weird but I all of a sudden we were going to culture classes every Saturday morning and we, you know we were we were just doing a whole lot of Indian activities. Oh, you know, nice, nice. Names. And so then as I became involved in these activities, I, it, it just, it was like the country was, was, was being brought to me. Yeah, and it was whispering to you. time there. And also I was spending time in India because um, mm-hmm. my kids were, we adopted them from India. 
So I was spending time um, mm -hmm. and getting to know my relatives and getting to know the neighborhoods. And, and so then, then I finally, I had a story I wanted to tell, but yeah. it's, it's a cross-cultural story. You know, as I mentioned, I was born in Britain mm -hmm. and I was, I was happy when I was a little child in Britain. And when I learned what colonialism meant with the British rule in India, I was really confused yeah. because here are these two places that I really enjoy, but this is really an unjust situation. And yeah. so I think that's why I like to write about um, the colonial period. Well, you're, you're unique in that because very few people have written about the actual um, time when the British and the Indians just sort of lived together as opposed to, you know, the, um, the difficult times, you know, the mutiny, the, as some people call it, the first war of independence, as we call it, you know, uh, is one, one aspect. But then a lot of times the concentration has been on the conflicts. And I, what I liked about the Bombay Prince is you, you describe the power relations more so than the, uh, the battle scenes, let's put it that way. The, the microaggressions are so obvious from your, uh, from your text. Yeah, I, I, I can, I'll give a few examples of the kinds of things yeah. that go on like that. Um, yeah. So Perveen is a, is a lawyer in the city. She's a 23 year old woman and she works with her father, you know, mm -hmm. who's the senior and the, there's just two of them. It's a family firm. Mm -hmm. And when they, you know, they, they handle all kinds of cases, but the legal system really, it's the Bombay, it's, it's, it's really the backbone of it is British people, even though there have started to be some Indian judges and there certainly are Indian lawyers, um, but it really is a, sort of like a British power scene. It's a British okay. power scene with the police and with, with the law um, and also with the health system. So everything to do with you know the coroner. So they have to be very po polite and they don't want to ever seem that they're on the side of the terrorists as yes. the Gandhi, yeah. activists were called. They called them terrorists yeah. um, because yeah. in their eyes that they wanted to dismantle the country. And, you know, when you think about here in the United States, when we hear about people doing that, we think, oh, yeah, they're domestic terrorists. And that's how that's how people were, were referred to. And some of them were some of them were interested in using force. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them weren't. So they have to really toe the line. And when Prince Edward the Eighth comes to visit Bombay, which actually happened in 1921, this mm -hmm. whole novel is set around Prince Edward's schedule and yes, where it, he yeah. went. And um, mm -hmm. all these people had to go to, um, to the receptions for him. Even Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who yeah. later founded Pakistan, he was at the reception, you know, <laughs> with his wife. I couldn't believe that. And so yeah. course, I had to put them in. Yeah. Um, and we, he, he plays like a little cameo in the story. And also, you know, I, I, re I refer to uh, Gandhiji a few times, um, but I don't ever do a face-to-face. Yes, because I don't want to get on anybody's bad side. Um, you know. <laughs> right. But Praveen does write to Muhammad Ali Jinnah and he's kind of important to the plot. Uh, and, you know, so so there's several historical figures who are mentioned in the book as well. Uh, we're getting a, um, we're getting a chat question for you uh, from Nina Singh. Uh, she's asking, Sujata, how many years did you live in India? I'm always amazed by authors like you, Mira Kamdar, and Tarkini Hall, who are born outside of India, but are still able to understand India and Indians so accurately. This has to be a unique talent. What would you say? Oh, gosh, I haven't lived in India. The longest time was when my father was on sabbatical when I was a child in the 70s. And believe it or not, I kept a journal. And it was, I was in, I was in second grade and I had an illustrated written journal of those days. And it was so wonderful. And I, I really think that helped, but over, it, it's been a total of about seven visits and maybe the longest time I've gone is about three weeks. But what I try to do is I try to 
have two visits bookending each book that I write. I start, I, w when I go on a visit, I'm fact checking details of a book that is almost ready to be, you know, that's being edited. And then I start the research for the next one. And so I do a little exploration. But then by the time that book's coming to the close, I think, oh my gosh, I've got to go see the college. So there is a very important college in this book. Mm -hmm. And originally I was going to call it, I'll tell you guys, because we're all friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was originally going to be Wilson College, mm -hmm. which is a famous, beautiful, famous um, stone college on the Seaface Road um, and the Marine Drive. And it's, it's been there since the 19th century and it's a co-ed school and it's a missionary college and it's also very accessible to visitors. Um, but when I realized that I was going to have mm, potential staff be identified, you know, be named and say, um, you know, they might've been a suspect or they did this or did that. I just had this paranoid feeling that people might look back and say, she's writing about so-and-so because you know, they really are duplicate names. Like I wrote, I wrote using names of a family in one of my Japanese novels and the Japanese family came and said, you wrote about my family. Um, it, they weren't mad, but they're like, where did you get all this information about our family? Cause mm -hmm. I used their name, I used their town, I used their interests. So I didn't want to run into that. So I called, I called it Woodburn College. Woodburn, yes, yes. So. Well, it worked out. You have a uh, Lockwood College, uh, Lockwood School, and another yeah. one. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so you you're uh, exploring the institutions as you go, which is very fascinating. Uh, you know, as as and and it also means that you have researched the routines of those institutions, which I, I found very interesting. Um, I like, for instance, the fact that uh, Praveen takes a bucket bath and things like that, you know, which I remember from living in India. And um, there, there are things that are so, so much fun from uh, details from that era, you know, fountain pens, for instance. And, and um, so um, I was actually quite fascinated by your shift to third person in Praveen mystery novels. Um, what did that feel like as you as you switch from first person to third person uh, for these novels? It was oh, interesting to me. Yes, that's a really good question. I never thought I could write a third person novel. Mm -hmm. I, I felt very clunky and clumsy when I tried, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to write a historical voice. And I thought that the best way that I could write a historical voice and you know, select certain words and have those words come into my mind would be as if I was reading a novel that was written in the 20s or 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some people that are able to do that very well. Mm. They're writing, um, it, you know, I better than I am, but that that was how I started wanting to do it. And also, Praveen is quite different from me. The character in my Japanese novels is named Rei Shimura, and she's a young woman who started out the same age as me. And um, she was just, I think she was very similar to me, except she was Japanese and American, not Indian mm -hmm. and German. Um, but this character, you know, I haven't been to law school. It's another age. So it, it felt, it felt better to do it in third person. I felt like I was giving her a little bit more dignity, um, you know, but I do really, I really do adore her. I, I think I would love to have her as a friend. Um, I think she has become a friend to so many people. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Yeah, well, she faces uh, so many conflicts that we face today as well. What was surprising to me is how many things just haven't changed also, you know, um, I mean, to me, she's a shiro, not a hero, but um, she tends to, she has to assert herself as the only woman lawyer in the country, and yet not scandalize. That's the other thing that was really fun to, to read. And, and um, in each novel, her being a woman actually becomes an advantage. And so speak about that a little bit. I mean, she can go where no man can go into the world of women. And you really 
use that and use her being a woman to expose what uh, what the society was like at that time. So tell us about that. Yeah, bit. well, I think that the example where it's the most defined of her using her gender to her advantage is in the first two books, mm -hmm. um, because there were certain communities where, especially elite communities, where women um, observe Purda and they Purda, yeah. separately. And mm -hmm. so in the Widows of Malabar Hill, she knows that there are some clients of her father's that, you know, they need some help, but they're not being allowed to see him because he's a male. And, mm -hmm. you know, the household guardian says they can't see a male. So she marches in. Yeah. And then in the second book, there's a situation where there's a royal family and it was extremely common, and this is a Hindu royal family, for royal ladies not to ever be seen by their subjects. And so one argument was, oh, it would defile them if somebody common looked at them. Another idea was, well, if nobody really knows what they look like, they're safer if there's an they're attack. Yeah. yeah. Somebody else can put on, you know, the the jewels and they can escape like a serving maid. And that actually did happen. If you watch a lot of Hindi movies, you know, you see things like that. Um, so, you know, she goes and she says, hey, you know, she she surprises them. They think there's going to be a male lawyer and, and she shows yeah. up. She's and a she shows lawyer. up. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, she's, she's Parsi, which is a minority community in India. Um, and do you have a strong Parsi connection yourself or or a knowledge of that community? Now I, mean, you I, probably now I, I feel like I do now. I did not do have now. that when I started. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I felt that I had to make Praveen a Parsi lawyer because the information I have about India's first three women lawyers is they yes. all had Parsi backgrounds. Really? So, oh, interesting. Yeah. So I like I just heard about another one when I was on my last visit. Yeah. Um, so that makes me not want to just assign it to no. a religion, say that's connected to my family background. Right. Because, you know, I have to do the research anyway, and I want to give them credit. You know, this community, um, they accepted having their daughters work with men in professional settings yeah. they encouraged them um not every family you know the modern ones but bombay was the center of like the most modern families mm -hmm. um, including the parsis and it was where they were the most parsis in the world and they were you know also the wealthiest parsis in the world so they could certainly afford to um you know send their daughters to Oxford or you know University of Bombay. I write about a working even, class. I bring in working class if, parties in this book too because yeah. we weren't all rich. You know there was a divide and also the, a divide. The second immigrant group that came from Iran in the 19th century, they were they were struggling and starting up a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what Frenny Cuttingmaster's family is that that type. Whereas a Praveen little family, lower down the social scale, yeah, shall we say? They, yes. they came to mm -hmm. India maybe 900 years previously. Nobody knows exactly when the first um, Iranian um, Zoroastrians landed in Gujarat. And you know that in the beginning, there weren't that many women, so there was some mixing. But yeah. later on, it, you know, the, but they were really not supposed to convert anyone. That was the rule that they you know, they agreed to with the, with the ruler of that area where they moved, that they would mm -hmm. not convert anyone and that they would wear Indian clothing. Um, and so they, they stuck by that. And so it's a very, very dwindling community, unfortunately, now. It is, but, but you know, a minority community always knows so much more about the majority community in every circumstance. I, I mean, whether you're talking about in the U.S. or whether you're talking about in England or in India, a minority community has to know more about the majority community. So I think Parveen also, um, you know, exposes a lot in, in, in her story about the other communities, the Hindu, Muslim, and Christian communities, 
uh, because they are the majority and she has to know about them. Yes, and she has to know job, different just, uh, names. She has to know, has to know. Um, cast. Um, not that she's going to necessarily discriminate against someone, but she's going to know whether just someone to know. someone here or there. Right. Um, so she she has to speak Marathi. And in fact, if you live in 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 Maharashtra, you know, this greater area, which now includes Bombay, if you want to have a, a job in government, you have to be a Marathi speaker or, right. or for the police. Anyway, I heard from somebody in the sure. police. So that has ruled out that 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 way, minority groups from other regions don't join that police force. You know, yeah. it rules out those people kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's interesting to me that, uh, like in the Satapur Moonstone, uh, Parveen stiffens in dismay at the realization that she'll be spending a night unchaperoned under the same roof as an Englishman, a single Englishman. Oh. I mean, you really are in those times when, when uh, you know, things like that mattered. The problem is they still matter. In Indian <laughs> society, in the elite oh, society, for sure, you know, your reputation matters still. Yeah. And so I, I just, I just laughed at that, but I also laughed with a sense of, ooh, I remember this. You know? Well, when I, I noticed this thing, whenever I check into a, like an Indian hotel, or I, I mean, I go to a lot of old-fashioned hotels and clubs. Yes. If I'm, I have to put my father's name. Or, you know, if I'm, or my husband's name or, you know, something you crazy. Just sign like in that. with that. Yeah. Because yeah. like, they're really responsible for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But speaking about men, let's, should we talk about guys? Should we talk ah, about sure. boys? <laughs> <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I, I did with Perveen that was a strategy that I learned from writing an earlier mystery series is okay. I wanted to keep being single um yeah, and she's uh, not only single she's divorced in this book yeah, well she's separated she's, she's separated, separated. That's right. she not can't quite get married yeah um she cannot get married but that keeps her in this wonderful state where i won't get all my heart won't go out and she'll be married by the end of the book or yeah. someone will propose because like I get swept away by some of these male characters myself that I, I would marry her off. And then what am I going to do in future books? Because right. what happened when these women lawyers married male lawyers is they stopped. They stopped. They stopped. And, and some still do. They, some, some of them still stop working as soon as they get married. Yeah. So what is the point of all of that legal training? And then, you know, she's gone to Oxford and not gotten a degree because they wouldn't give a degree to, to women lawyers. And yet she's, she's working and everything. So um, it, it, is, it is quite fascinating because the other thing that comes out because she is single and does not have that degree and everything is what's gonna become of her when she's 70 something? She thinks about that. And I think that's quite fascinating because as we know from social groups such as Ekal Nari, you know, which are the, uh, the the groups that are trying to help single women in India, these are very difficult circumstances. If you're single in Indian society, you're unclaimed by a man, and it's it's tough. It's just not easy, not only to be a widow or to be a single yeah. woman. Either way, it's very tough. Yeah. When I was um, doing research, um, you know, and, st and staying in India the last time of maybe just a couple years ago, actually 2020, I was reading that it's almost impossible for single women to get to rent flats. Yes. That they exactly. get discriminated against. Also, meat eaters. That's another one. And meat eaters. Yeah. So that's yeah. another problem. So yeah, that that is still true. That that's that's difficult. Well, which leads me to the question about power relations in general, not only between men and women, but, you know, she's fighting so many different other things like age, ageism or uh, the age factor, you know, like she has to be so respectful to her father and not disagree with him. And there are times when he says, well, let me go because of course I have the experience and you don't, you know. So, um, you know, she's, uh, she's hemmed in by so many different um, uh, conflicts. It's not just 
the fact that she's a lawyer and it's it's against women. There's also the age factor. Yeah, she is. But I'd also say that Praveen's a happy person. Yeah, uh, you know, she gets tense during her um, the crime. You know, trying to solve the case, and if someone's yeah. in danger, she gets tense. And yeah. is she going to be able to handle this? Right? Yeah. When she stands up in the coroner's court, is she going to make a fool out of herself, or is she going to get the get the information she yeah. needs? Um, and but I love the fact that she's so concerned about other lawyers who are going to come after her, other women lawyers. What kind of uh, example is she going to set for them? That's such a beautiful thought. And, and I love that she um, that she has that as she's all stressed out and tense and everything, yeah. you know. So but I want to ask you, um, what surprised you most about the material that you uncovered in researching the laws of India in the 1920s as they relate to women. Um, what surprised you? Because some of these things, of course, you must have expected well, as part of feminist history, but what surprised you? One of the things that surprised me is the groups that were allowed to divorce and the groups that maybe got property. And, and for example, um, the Muslim women were the best off for a while in terms of being, having the freedom to divorce. Um, because there was a period where British women could not get a divorce. And then they got, by the time my book has started, British women can get a divorce. Yeah. But you and have, they have all this the proof yeah. to get a divorce. The British would need proof to have a divorce. They'd have to have proof of infidelity. Parsis would need proof of infidelity. Hindus couldn't divorce at all. Um, and then there were just like different... Um, amounts of property that people could have you know by the religion and and so i i and, and also the age of marriage was mm -hmm. different by the community so what was so you know a, a big shock to me is that i felt it was very hypocritical of the british to say it's okay to get married at 10 if you're muslim but it's, you know, you have to be 16 if you're a uh, Hindu or 14 or, you know, these laws were always changing. And, you know, so that that was really something to talk about because one of the ways that they managed to hold on to rule or to, to get the, the British public to support British rules to say, we're fighting for women's safety and mm -hmm. we're fighting for older marriage ages and all this, but it wasn't really... It, it didn't really pan out like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, and like in the, remember the Sleeping Dictionary, which was the older book that I wrote before that, I discovered that when there were these crises, very often it was Indians who came together and made these charitable groups, you know, and that they like started the hospitals or they started soup kitchens and things like that. So there was quite a lot of activity going on, including with Indian women, um, usually along in religious communities. It was usually your religious community, your regional community, um, and we're going to have this hospital. We're, we're mm -hmm. going to make a hospital. And so, in fact, in my next book, I'm writing about a women's, a mystery about women's reproductive rights. <laughs> All <laughs> it right. Sounds, I don't know how that sounds, but, um, you know, there was just such a huge mortality rate um over half the babies that were born in bombay in the 1920s would die within the year mm -hmm. the leading cause of death for women was childbirth and complications after childbirth like gyn problems mm -hmm. there was birth control was out was outlawed um you know there, there was just, so it's it was a really volatile situation and people were wanting to control their fertility. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting Perveen involved in something like that. And that's also very interesting for her because she's in a situation where she may never have children again, or well, not that she ever had any children, but she may never have children if she stays separated. She, And then some people are having affairs in the 1920s. Oh yeah, yeah, they would. But is, is there, um, you know, I'm always, contrasting then and now as I'm reading the Purveen mystery novels, right? Because we do. I mean, if uh, historical fiction is meant for that, after all. I mean, uh, if it doesn't comment on your times today, 
it is kind of irrelevant, right? So I think uh, I want to ask you about a general set of contrasts that you'd like uh, readers to notice as we read the Bombay Prince, or do you just want us to come away just grateful that we live in these times? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, one of the things about th that happened really in 1921, in November 1921, was right after um, the prince arrived in Bombay, there was a huge uh, rioting where um, you had uh, Parsis and Anglo-Indians versus Hindus and Muslims. So this is one of the few times that Hindus and Muslims lined up together and they were, they were carrying the, the flag of the Congress party. They were saying that the Congress, we, we don't want the British, we don't want the Prince here and you're fans of the Prince because you are Parsi and Anglo-Indian. And of course, not all people were, but probably a majority were, were comfortable with British rule. So it was a tremendous amount of um, violence and people, not trusting each other. And then also these divisions within say Praveen's family where oh, yeah. she wants Indian freedom and her family has been comfortable. They think it's financially advantageous. Now, what does this remind you of? Does this remind you of any past elections and <laughs> difficulties that people had around the table? and? Sure. not talking to their relatives for a while. I mean, this whole thing, it just, it was so divisive at that time. Yeah. Later on, it was not so divisive because so many more Indians were in favor of nationalism. But in the 1920s, there were quite a few people that had benefited that were afraid. Um, they were afraid of a Hindu majority country. Yes. They were, but I mean, this is not a time at which Jinnah has asked for Pakistan. This is before 1930. And so mm -hmm. we haven't yet, uh, in, in, your, in, in the Bombay Prince, we haven't yet encountered the demand for Pakistan or anything like that. So, so the, the divisions that we're seeing in this novel are still quite, um, shall we say, nascent where it comes to Pakistan. And, um, mm -hmm. and so, do you, do you feel that uh, as you go through or? Um, you know, you know I think about that Jinnah house a lot, you know, that yeah. there was, because um, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a very, very successful um, lawyer in um, Bombay. He was a criminal defense lawyer. He was one of the best dressed men. He had this incredible mansion. Um, and that mansion, I was lucky enough to be driven by it in Malabar Hill. Yes. And that became my mental model for the Farid bungalow that the Farid wives live in, in the widows of Malabar Hill. In the widows, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, it was just a, it was a time that I don't think he saw that, you know, I really don't, he was dabbling in the freedom movement, but he certainly wasn't thinking as far as we know, about a Pakistan. And so there, there were not those divisions um, between Hindus and Muslims yet. You know, there were still- yeah. and, and, um, Iqbal, and the poet Iqbal was still very much of a nationalist for both Hindus and Muslims. You know, uh, he was not at that time, the, the poet had not yet written um, his manifesto for Pakistan, you know, so. So there are many things that move things along uh, along that journey, and poetry, of course, was one of them uh, in India. So one of the things I love doing is you'll notice that in Praveen's household they have a Christian cook, they mm -hmm. have a, a Hindu driver, they have another Hindu servant in Mystery House, which is the ancestral home, which is where the law firm is. They have their their number one employee is a is an older Muslim gentleman, Mustafa, mm -hmm. who's a veteran of, of the military, who sort of runs the runs the show there. And so there's just they're really comfortable with an intermingling of religions and um well they're comfortable but they also control it after all their servants. I mean this this mm -hmm. reminded me to a certain extent of uh, Gone with the Wind, you know, where 
uh, everybody is maintaining uh, the status quo um, in the household because that's what the servants are supposed to do. You know, mm -hmm. so so there was that. Uh, you you don't show the tension as much, but I think um, uh, I think it's there. I think it's it's underlying just the way you've set up the power relations. It it uh, we we take that away even if you haven't been explicit about it. You know. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a question coming in over here from Christina Gomez, saying I enjoyed the dynamic between Parveen and Alice, Alice Hobson Jones. Uh, how does their friendship propel or support Parveen's development? And she's referring to a friend that Praveen has who she met at Oxford and the, both of them did not get their degrees, which I was very upset about. And, uh, and her question is, uh, Christina's question is, how does their friendship propel or support Praveen's development? It's quite an interesting one. Yeah, so um, yeah, Alice Hobson Jones, they, they met, they actually met on the ship going to Oxford. Um, mm -hmm. And Alice is feels like an outcast. Um, for one thing, she loves women and she was caught with someone when she was in school and she was sent to, there's just a little bit of information about that. She was sent to a sanatorium. And so she got out, but she has to be very careful because well, first of all, homosexuality was illegal. It was illegal for men there was no law stated for women because no one could imagine that women would do that. Right. Right. Um, but, you know, she, she doesn't want to get married and her mother wants her to get married. Mm -hmm. So she and, and Perveen, they both have this thing where they don't want to get married and they want to work. And they, and also Alice's, Alice and Perveen are both interested in the feminist movement and they've, They've attended suffragette events in Britain, mm -hmm. um, you know, where I've alluded to that. So that they are good supports for each other. And in fact, the reason that uh, Alice is working as a mathematics professor at Woodburn College in this book, and in the in a previous book, the mystery family has talked about like seeing if they can help Alice get a job because they know so many people. In Alice, yeah, and Alice's yeah. family that's British and her father is way up in the in the government. They don't really want her to work, especially the mother. The mother mm -hmm. wants her to get married. You know, she's get married, still yeah. working on it. Yeah. So, so I have, yeah, I, I want to develop Alice further. Um, you know, she's playing another role. She we missed her in book two um, because book two was out of town and I just can't have uh -huh. Alice going everywhere. That would be unbelievable. Right. Um, so, but we, she's a big character in this book because she's at the college and at the college, she has the problem where, because she's British, the Indian faculty don't trust her at all because of their experience with other British people. Sure. And everyone thinks she's supportive of the rule. And there is a, there is fun, there's an Irish background teacher and he mm -hmm. doesn't like her either because he <laughs> thinks she's just this, you know, rich guy's powerful mm -hmm. man's daughter, and he wants mm -hmm. to fight the establishment. So she really has a she really has a, a difficult situation, um, and she wants to help Praveen, but she's also in. She she could risk a lot if she screws her job up. Right. There are so many different um, um, references to these times, which are very important times. One of the things you reference in this uh, novel, and I would be remiss if I didn't point it out, is the Gadar movement in Canada. So tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> oh gosh, I bet you can tell me tell us so much more about it. Um, but it <laughs> was some also, experience. I know it. There was an overseas movement of Indians who who had who had gone abroad. Um, that were not in Britain, but they were, say, in the United States or they were in Canada and who knows where else. And they were united wanting to help people in India um, become free of the British. And what I understand about the Ghadar Party is they, they felt that they were experiencing, say, they, these, these Indians in California, these farmers from Punjab who were there in the 19th century, they were experiencing all kinds of discrimination. 
And they believed that discrimination was rooted in the colonial system. And so they thought they had to dismantle colonialism and they didn't have Mahatma Gandhi sitting with them. So they had their own ideas about what to do. What can you add what to, to tell people about? I think, I think that's a pretty good explanation of, of what, uh, what their objectives were in, in general. Um, and yes, they, they did have a different perspective perhaps. Um, so let's leave it at that. But yeah. I, I, I know it because there's it. like a hint, like there's something there's of Shauna there's in the book, but I'm not <laughs> going to say what it is. If anybody, if anybody's done and they look <laughs> there, they'll know. They'll know. Was that, was that an ancestor of yours who appeared in my book? I don't know, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> Uh, the Bombay Prints, folks, available now from Boswell Books. You can buy it from anywhere in the world by going to boswellbooks.com. I want you to get it in hardcover because you'll want Praveen's mysteries, Praveen Mysteries' curiosity and her intrepid sense of fairness to live in your library and inspire you whenever you need her. And I strongly recommend all of Sujata's books, my particular favorite being The Sleeping Dictionary and now The Bombay Prince. So, <laughs> um, a recording of this conversation will be available in a couple of weeks or even, even uh, sooner on Boswell's site. So Sujata Massey's insights on writing historical fiction can inspire more writers. And certainly Sujata, you inspire me to continue writing as well. And so thank you so much for a most interesting and enlightening conversation. I'm looking forward to meeting you again and in person. Oh. So. Well, that's the thing. It's everybody, it's it's a strange coincidence that we're both in Maryland. Shauna should be in Wisconsin, right? Yeah. But she's, for some reason, we're both in Maryland. So we're, I even thought Actually, when I heard you were here, would we fit around my edge of the kitchen island where I'm Zooming from? <laughs> But then I thought, no, this probably is better to be separate and we'll get together. Oh, definitely, tomorrow. yeah. No, this yeah. was good. And and uh, I think uh, I'm just looking forward to our walk tomorrow and meeting you again. So thank you for yeah. this conversation. I'll turn it back to Daniel. I point. have a question for you, Daniel. Daniel, are, do you have signed book plates that people can put in their books? Um, I um, think we were getting them from you. I oh, feel like sure. we did. Let me just check my... Yeah. I usually put the note when they arrive. Well, and... I just want to tell everyone about them that I had designed these beautiful um, full color book plates that have like imagery taken from this cover and I sign my name on them. So if you get the book for yourself or for your a friend, you can press that in. And I would suggest you could press it in. I'll show oh. you. I know what happened. Soho said they were delayed somehow. Here, you could press it in here. You know, you could do, there are different places you could put it. So it'd be, make it more of a keepsake. And Daniel, yeah. please reserve one for me, okay? Oh, we'll, we'll do. I should be, we're sending you. We should have sent you one if you haven't gotten it already. Yes, I did. Get, I you did. got a galley. Yeah. I got yeah. a galley. Yeah, but yeah. she wants the permanent light. Uh, you everybody is going to want a permanent gun yeah definitely someone. ask when you um click on the purchase ask for the signed book plate i think they were delayed by soho but they should be coming any day and you know if you got your copy from us and you're local we can leave a copy for you and we can we can work a way to get you copy too i assume that uh, we were talking about the ivy bristol for you you actually if somebody is, says oh book plates aren't good enough for me i must have a personally like a signed copy you probably have copies at ivy that, that they have signed right right yeah. I would say that there are a few places in the country where they actually are are okay. signed um and i have that info on my website and also i send out a newsletter like about maybe every month or two just with interesting giveaways like for example this book is an audio book and i have audio book codes i'm going to be giving away like in a raffle next month and just little articles and recipes. And so if you like that kind of thing, just kind of, you could sign up for that at my website. I um, just put like a little button for that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank I just put yeah. a button for that. And everybody, when you see a nice link, click on it, it will open up in another window. And then when this event goes away, 
um, those windows will remain. So you can order your book or sign up for, um, or order, um, I, somebody put in their notes that they um, ordered a tiger claw. So, um, uh, so cool. Um, anyway, That's have great. a wonderful time tomorrow, I'll tell us. Um, thank, thank you, you. we will. A wonderful yeah. conversation, wonderful comments in um, our chat. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us because we wouldn't have a virtual bookstore without you. Hope to see you at another event and I'm looking forward to book number four. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I am too. It's inspiring to be with people and you know, to celebrate something that's been finished, but there's always another one to, to, to keep going. You know, this will keep me going till I'm old, I think.